Well, they want you to start out with, uh, what was your childhood like? So, my parents met at DePaul Summer School when they were in college. And I think for both of them, they like wanted to do something their families wouldn't approve of. So, my father's family was from the Ermanjaya region, which is now in Iran. Came over when he was three. Um, so, he has a sibling that was born here. And that was right after World War One, And um, the Brits had, um, as they had in, later on in other areas, what they called forced sedentarization. So they, they didn't matter what tribe you were in or anything. They took family units and animals, and they had built corrals and fake towns. And you, went, you were assigned to go there. So they left. Um, they were um, Christians, Assyrians are Christians. They left and they came here through India. So they walked to the walked to the water. Many people stayed in India and there's lots of Assyrians of his generation on the Malabar coast. And they came through California. Many people stayed in California and um, Turlock. I don't know, I'd have to check to see if this is still true, but um, Certainly when my son was growing up, it was still true. Turlock had the highest percentage of Assyrians in their population. And the advantage of staying in California was that you could work with the Armenians. And in the local culture, the Armenians were higher than Assyrians because Armenians had a country, and Armenians were allowed to own land. Assyrians were not allowed to own land. So they met at DePaul. My mother... Grew up in this neighborhood. Her father said that the reason all of his daughters married out was that he didn't move to Skokie when they were young enough. He moved to Skokie, they were too old, so like, you know, he let them do things like go to DePaul, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it was not a happy union. My mother still says the biggest mistake of her life was marrying my father. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, she talks about it all the time. She's 87 years old. My father died, but um, he died 12 years ago. I still drive his car. Um, wow. So then, so she gets divorced, and when I was in eighth, well, I, she got divorced before that, but when I was in eighth grade, she had this pattern of, in the summer, she would send me off to some relative. So I wasn't home that summer, summer between eighth grade and my freshman year. I come home, she tells me she's getting married, she's marrying this guy who d doesn't want to leave the neighborhood, so we're moving to Cicero. So this is 1966, I'm like, you know, everybody else is like moving to Highland Park. Right. Skokie. We're moving to Cicero. <laughs> Complete insanity. Complete insanity. Absolutely. It damaged my relationships with both her family and my father's family because nobody was going to come and visit us in Cicero. I mean, it was the 60s in Cicero. They right. burned down our garage. They painted swastikas on my locker. I mean, it was complete and utter insanity. Of course. Being yeah. in high school in Cicero. And my father, they, he didn't want me to go to a mixed high school. So I was supposed to go to St. Scholasticus because it was all girls. So I left St. Scholasticus the middle of my first semester and got dunked at Morton East. Okay where, you know, gangs were in different hallways. If you weren't affiliated, you couldn't use the bathrooms. I mean... Did you know, you, you, I'm sure you know now, that when the year you were born, 1952, was the year that the first black family moved into Cicero, and there was this huge riot there. Yeah. Did you, did you, were you aware of that? When you were that age, were you aware um, of this? Um, well, I didn't know about yeah. that, but... Right. I mean, 1966 was kind of a big year out there. I knew yeah. about that. I mean, I knew that they had vandalized graves at Waldheim. Because for many years in Chicago, Jews couldn't get buried inside the city limits. Right. So, like, the graveyards are, like, west of uh, Pulaski over here on Peterson. Waldheim, which is, starts in Berwyn and goes west to the western suburbs. My mother's family is there. I mean, I knew that stuff. Right. Um, I knew that, you know, the nat National Guard stood around and ate kolajki and, and drank coffee while the citizens beat up the black open housing. At the time when that happened, I didn't really understand until I moved to Cicero, like, 
why did these black people want to live there? This place is a dump. <laughs> <It's laughs> like, I mean, if you had to pick yeah. a, a, a suburb to right. integrate, why would you pick this place? Right. Right. And not just the people. I mean, it wasn't a... It, they were a net exporter of jobs. Because um, Western Electric was still open. They still right. uh, made all the telephones in the United States in Cicero. Not to mention the defense industry that Western Electric supported. Um, they had steel. They had steel fabrication. Um, they had... Um, I, we, at, so my mother stayed married for less than a year. Because, of course, she wasn't going to be married to some stupid to Polak. No, to, to the second, to the second husband. Some stupid Polak that didn't want to live the na- leave the neighborhood. Was your father the first husband? Yeah. So she... Oh, wow. So she gets divorced. She yeah, marries yeah. this guy. She moves us to Cicero. To, to be with him. Yeah. Because he didn't want to leave the same. neighborhood. And I mean, I'm like 14 years old. I'm like, this doesn't sound good. I mean, if there was a neighborhood to leave. Right. It'd be this one. If be you would think it would be Cicero. I mean, if he had been from Highland Park or Glenview, then of course he wouldn't want to leave the neighborhood. Well, so and then you're there and you're 16 or you're four, well, you're 14 mm-hmm. when you get there. and But you're 16 when... The riots happened in Cicero, or at least there was there was that. Uh, this is well, sixteen in sixty eight, everything 68. burned. Right. There had been open housing marches and stuff before that, but sixty eight. Then yeah. that was when. It's kind of a climb. Shall we say the proverbial shit hit the fan? Right. So how? So, so at how? that point, my mother's dumped the second husband. She's decided it's not good to move because then I will have gone to three high schools. Of course, when she threw about, I was like, yes. <laughs> Right. And um, so we were living, at that point, we were living at 35th and Central. We were talking about Cicero in the 60s. Right. So, it's, I mean, how could you look up Cicero in the 60s now and not be frightened to death at everything that comes up? Well, it was pretty wild. I mean, they fought in the halls, they carried switchblades. I mean, it was like... The West Side Story movie set. It was like they were living in West Side Story. And somewhere along the line there, you started going to the YMCA. So we had this one guy, Steve Everett, who would be an interesting person for someone to interview, who was a history teacher there. He was U of C trained, and he was like from Nebraska or Kansas or something. (laughs) And... He had this after-school club called the Student Volunteer Services. So I joined that. I mean, I was trying to figure out how to make friends. And I met a bunch of people there. And at some point through, it was called SVS, through SVS, we met the director, his first name was Ron, I can't remember his last name now, of the Cicero Borough and Y. Now, the Y was very controversial there because, you know, it was not... Well, there were enough, like, sort of Nazi types and Ku Klanner types at the Y. My high school girlfriend, Dr. Morelli, she might be able to explain that better. But it was really controversial. So they didn't have, like, a normal YMCA building. They just had this little outpost. And I don't know how it happened. I would love to ask her. But they hired Vivian Rothstein as their youth worker. Was, so, as far as I know, she Richie was right Rostein, out of college. She was right out of college, but her husband, Richie, was elected leadership in SDS. So when SDS Democratic. broke up, Students for Democratic Society, when SDS broke up, they had a whole analysis about why they had failed to make the revolution, right? One of them was that they hadn't organized the working class. And I don't know what Richie was doing then. I mean... He's a nice guy. I met him a few times. Like sometimes she would t- like take us to their apartment in Oak Park. Yeah. I don't know what he was doing, but she was working at the Y, and she was starting the women's union. CWA. Hi. So me and my girlfriend Morelli, whose name isn't really Morelli, but that's a side story. Me and Morelli and another friend of mine, Leona, and a couple other girls who had been in SBS together. At the time. Yeah, sixteen and seventeen, you know, or fifteen and sixteen probably started going to the Y and going to this, like, girls group that she had organized. And she would, I mean, this would never be allowed now. She would, like, take us on 
field trips, like down to Heather Booth's house in Hyde Park. And we would babysit while they had meetings. We had a blast. We loved it. And so you These were like cool people, cool places to go, yeah. something to do. And so a day-to-day -day basis, you were doing all sorts of stuff. Well, I was working, and then when I was 15, my mother threw me out of the house, so I was living at Morelli's house, and then I was working a lot, but I was also doing stuff, you know, when I wasn't working, I was doing stuff with Vivian and the Y, and, but it wasn't like, it wasn't overtly political. I mean, I think that's one of the lessons I took into politics, was that it was like she was modeling a different role for women and girls than we would have ever thought of on our own. She didn't, like, lecture us about politics. I mean, politics and stuff. I mean, I wasn't really 100% sure until they got the um, office at California and CIRMIC. I, I, you know, I didn't really understand they were starting an organization. You know, I liked them. I met Terry Rudinsky then. I mean, I, I, you know, they were cool. We babysat. We had a good time. So how old were you when they got the office? I don't know. We'd have to do the. We'd have to do the yeah. math. I think so. But that you were still in high school then. I was still in high school. Right. So then it's sort of. So then instead of going to the Y, you going to the office. Right. So early on, when they first got the office, so then it was Vivian and Day Creamer. When they first got the office, they got written up in. I think it was Red Book. It might have been Family Circle in something about what women's liberation was, and they got tons of mail. The mail came in bags and bags, and we used to sit there and read the letters, and we would put them in piles. I don't think, I'd have to ask Morelli, I don't think we actually wrote the answers ourselves, but this was like, I mean, can you imagine how cool that was yeah. for us? All people all over the country. From people reading. all over the country. All different stories about their lives, their ages, their this, their that, and their aunt, their, they saw this article. You know, and Morelli's mother owned the Slovak beauty parlor. She was Morelli. That's a whole different story. Why she's called Morelli? But anyway, so she's working. She's like doing. She's a shampoo girl. Mm -hmm. I'm working at Freylock's ice cream factory. It's not like this was the only thing right. we were doing, but it was a blast. And you said something in your in your bio biographical sheet about also being trained as a typesetter. Being trained well, that happened later. Oh, that's later. That, that's later. So this later. time you're working at the ice cream shop, but you're spending your time... But the factory, cool no, this factory. is like where they make ice cream. Okay. And then I needed another job, and I was working at this place, Bonton Poultry, where, like, cut-up chickens came down the assembly line, and, like, you would be in charge of, like, pulling off all the legs, yeah. or maybe all the legs would come, and you were supposed to just pick out legs that were the same size. Oh, jeez. That was on Lake Street. That was a real dump. But, you know, so we're doing, like, these complete, total working-class jobs, yeah. and we're hanging around with them, and they're so... And so would you say that Rothstein was one of the most influential people that you met? Yeah, she was much more in influential than Heather or Day. I mean, Day was always nice to us, and Heather was nice to us, too. And Ter Terry was, too, Terry Radinsky. It wasn't like they weren't nice, but Vivian was ours. Right. We viewed her as ours. As a friend. Somebody that you can well, talk to about I don't know. I don't know how much we talked to her about. You know, because at one point I got pregnant, my mother threw me out of the house, and I was babysitting for this lady who worked the Cicero Avenue bars, which were still like sort of prostitution haunts, and her husband, um, her Muggsy, she. Muggsy Tortorella was her father-in-law who ran money from the, because the horse tracks were still open, ran the money from the horse tracks, and she says to me, she says, you're not having no baby, that's what happened to me. But she takes me to this, this is, I just closed the loop on this story this past year. She takes me to this doctor on, Cicero, on Cermak Road, yeah. who has like these big burly guys sitting in the room and this and that. He's the mafia doctor, oh and I had an abortion. And oh I mean, God. I was 15. I didn't really, Morelli was really oh, mad at me. Time, I mean, getting abortion is very controversial then. Oh, it's it still illegal. Now, but it was illegal. It was then. still illegal. But Heather says that guy was one of the doctors Jane used. She and I just put this together when Jane we were in Boston. Jane, the um, abortion service of the Women's Union. Oh. But I didn't come through Jane. I was like in Cicero, and he was the local guy. Oh, Isn't that... 
he did gunshots, you know, yeah, anything you did. Really he did a lot of. Oh, it's pretty insane. So, any relationships uh, with boys or with girls or with what's what's that like? In high school? Yeah. So, when I got pregnant, Bradley's like, God, what kind of neighborhood did you grow up in? You don't know anything. You got to tell me everything you don't know, and I'll just explain it now. I said, how can I tell you what I don't know if I don't know it? I can't tell you what I don't know. She was so mad at me. She beat him up, she beat up the boyfriend, because she had found me the boyfriend. And then at some point she told me, if you don't have sex with them, I'm going to run out of guys for you. You know, that's the only reason why they want to be your boyfriend. So right. I, you know, I like, so I was having, I mean, the whole thing is like so totally insane. When you look back at it, but you know, I wanted to have friends and I wanted to fit in, and I knew Absolutely. I didn't know what was going on. So, you know, I was doing whatever she, I still do what she tells me. You used to talk to her? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I still see, I still see her. I mean, I see her all the time. We still, both of us still see Leona, who grew up on her block. Um, Leona's like not that savvy about, um, you know, electronic communication and stuff like that. She mm -hmm. never left home. She was the one who got sent, stayed home and took care of the parents. So we don't, it's harder to keep in touch with her. So American Public Health Association this year is in New Orleans, and Morelli and her husband are driving down, so we're going to hang out there. They go to New Orleans all the time. I've never awesome. been to New Orleans. It's an amazing city. I've been there a few times. Yeah, I've never been so there. So one, one of the questions they ask on here, which I think is interesting, and I think you may have already touched on it, it's certainly interesting in Cicero. It says, what is the first experience that you had with racism, sexism, or homophobia? And it means not just well, for you. But I mean, for, like, what do you mean by racism? I mean, I used to, as a kid, I'd be walking down the street with my mother, and random people I didn't know would come up to me, and they'd say, you, you are Epi, Epi's daughter. That was my father's, like, uh, a Syrian, like, house name. You are Epi's daughter. I'd say, yes. This is a Jewish they point to my mother. <laughs> you are not a Jew. Father is Syrian, you are a Syrian. You are not a Jew. These would be just my people like Yeah, what, eight, nine? Eight, nine, ten. But I were like, you know, just uh, in the neighborhood. Like the Assyrians didn't live here. They lived with the Swedes over um, like on Clark Street and places like that then and, and with the Greeks at Lawrence and Western. So she and I would just be walking around and random people would come up to me. So that was pretty, it's, so it was sort of like always there. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know how else to put it. It was like, but this was Chicago. I mean, that's kind of a funny question oh, sure. in the context of Chicago. Yeah. Because it's, you know. And then when you got out to... So when I got out to Cicero, Cicero it must have been, they burned down our garage. They painted swastikas on my was locker. Who they that burned down your garage? You never found out? No. Well, I mean, there were so many possibilities, you know. I mean, there were guys who would, like, wear, you know, SS-type uniforms and hang around outside the school. I mean, like, high school-age kids who did stuff like that. You know, I mean, it was 1968, Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia. All yeah, sorts of assholes yeah. came over here. Yeah. You know. You, were you guys aware of, um, must have been big news, what happened with the Democratic National Convention in 68, too, was... Yeah, but, you know, we were in, I think I was too young to understand how important that was. Right. I mean, and we were in Cicero and, like. It's very local. Actually. Well, we had, our, like, our own street fights going yeah, on. Yeah, know, so, like, there was one down in. Well, that's the hard with thing With Mayor Daly and Grant right. Park. I mean, you know. That's and, like, the thing. whole anti-war thing played out very differently in Cicero because so. it was kind of a cool thing. I mean, if you wanted to get out and you were a guy. Joining the army was a way out. I mean, what else were you going to do? Work at Seco Steel? You know? And I mean, they were all so racist. They were, like, killing gooks. What the fuck? Yeah, right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that certainly didn't bother them. <laughs> when you were working with Rothstein, what were the issues that motivated her the most? What were the ones that, that you guys got, uh, that she tried to get you guys interested? Well, we knew she was against the war. We knew she really hated the war. And, you know, I mean, you know, that was okay. We, we didn't really... Care we didn't care all that much about the war. I mean, but we knew, sort of, and I think this is one of the things I brought forward to my life even now, is she wanted better lives for girls. And we knew girls had really shitty lives. I mean, that was obvious. Right, right. <laughs> you know? 
We were sort of like the poster girls for shitty lives. Absolutely. And, so um, you're, and so now you're... So we knew she wanted better lives for girls. Better lives for girls. And we knew she was smart. I mean, she'd been all these places. Where did I... I had never been to California. Too so smart. then... Oh, no, but... Then, in December of 69, Fred Hampton gets killed. They were partying in the halls. They were like... This was like the big deal. And I thought... Fuck, I'm not coming back here. I already got into college. I had gotten into the University of Minnesota. I applied to three schools. This is the case. Yeah. I applied to three schools. University of Minnesota, because one of the guys who worked at the Y had gone there. And we didn't really have, like, high school counseling at Morton. Like, is that how you heard about it the first time? I had heard about University of Minnesota from the guys at the Y. Because Vivian was, like, the girls' group person. There were people doing stuff with guys. And I applied to... Um, Yellow Springs to Antioch because I heard dope grew on the mall, so I thought that was pretty cool. But I really wanted to go to a girls' school, so I applied to Barnard, and my mother wouldn't let me go for the interview. Oh, dear. So, and I was too stupid to tell, ask my father. I should have just asked my father. He would have taken me. So I ended up at the University of Minnesota. I got into Antioch, but the um, financial aid wasn't that great, so I ended up at the University of Minnesota. But... I hadn't really, like, finished high school because I left in December. But So this is, night, you know, I end up in, so what I did from then until I went to college, that's a whole other story, but I end up at the University of Minnesota in the fall of 70, and, like, I don't have, like, a high school transcript. I was like, yeah, well, you know, it was kind of a dumpy place. I think they just forgot to send it, and no one ever followed up. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. I, don't think I mean, it was 1970. Today. No, yeah. you couldn't get away with that today. So, you, so, so the strange thing is, is from the research, you know, it looked like you were in, enrolled in school for like eight or nine years. Well, you know, we were we had a lot of fish to fry during that time. Plus, yeah. so you, so I was you, self-supporting. Yeah. So you know. So you were part time most of the time. I was part. Well, I had. This is what we used to do. We would like register for 22 credits in fall quarter and take incompletes. We ruined incompletes for your generation. We take incompletes and then finish them like the next semester or well they were it was a quarter system. The next quarter or maybe the next two quarters. So we because if you fifteen and above was the same price. Right. So then we would just like dribble out the work, but I mean I did all sorts of shit in college besides going to class. Right, well as far as I'm as I could tell you involved in a commune. Were you involved in the Whittier commune? No. Uh, we had a house at um, 28th and Stevens. And then that house kind of broke into a couple of different houses. But Whittier commune, that was much better. That was much more established. Oh. This was, like, less well organized um, than that. But, well, I did that. I, um, I had met one of the first people I met when I moved to Minnesota was David Tilson, whose father, Ken Tilson, was one of the Wounded Knee lawyers. Wow. And they, the, um, I mean, this is a long time ago. The um, International Treaty Organization wanted status in the UN and as an NGO. I mean, this was like a new thing, NGO, status in the UN, International Treaty Organization, Canada and the U.S., and Ken felt like I would do a better job of handling myself out in, in, um, at Pine Ridge, like getting together the work and doing this and that, the various things that had to happen for them to make their case. So for three summers, I lived Pine, on Pine Ridge for part of the Pine summer. Uh, the western end of South Dakota, Pine Ridge, oh, sure, Wounded sure, Knee. Sure, 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 sure. So this is like... You, so know, you weren't taking classes then, obviously. Well, I, there were a lot of times when I wasn't taking classes, but those summers, I was doing that. What were you doing out there again? You were working with... So, I mean, there were tons of documentation that was needed to go before. I think going before the UN, this was a big deal. I think this was maybe 72. We'd have to look it up. It was whenever, it was after Wounded Knee and whenever they hadn't yet caught Leonard Peltier because the... The federales were running all over looking for Leonard Peltier, and the way food was coming onto the reservation was that they were dropping it uh, in um, cubic yarders onto the reservation. I mean, it was pretty insane. But 
so... You know, I had survived Cicero. Who cares if that was right. insane? I mean... <laughs> you were out in, out in South Dakota doing <laughs> activism so, for so American dude. causes. You know, and Jose Barrero, who uh, was the NPR reporter that covered Wounded Knee, and he would stay with us when he was in Minneapolis. So it was a whole nother set of uh -huh. things, things that were going on. I thought Wounded Knee happened in, like, 1890. It happened again. It happened again. So what happened was, in the 70s was... Something else that happened mm -hmm. that I'm unfamiliar with. Mm -hmm. I have to brush up on my history here, but so you're talking about there was another occupation, and it was a whole set of things. I would actually have to look up and see yeah. what had caused caused what was the start, what was the spark for that. Did did you, did you have any ideas at this point about what you would be in in the future, about what no. you wanted to? Do you no. know what you would major in? So. We had this thing at the University of Minnesota called the Experimental College, right? So you could, like, design your own major. And my father had said to me, you're going to go to college? You need to learn about the Greeks because they run this place. The Greeks? <laughs> the Greeks. He says, they're in charge. doesn't matter all this other shit. The Greeks are running this place. So that's like a whole other train of yeah, things. Yeah. There was this guy, Misha Penn, who taught, it was called Life of the Mind, it was a five-quarter class um, in humanity. So I took a tremendous, that's one reason why I was there so long, is I took a tremendous number of humanities classes. I took a lot of history classes. I was too stupid to take more world history. I mostly took American history, because, you know, for my father, that was the issue, was American history, and I was interested in it, too. I don't mean to say I did it for him, but looking back, I didn't understand I'm really just learning European history now, in a way. Um, you know, so that's one reason why. I, but I knew I had to, like, be able to do something. And you came, and you left sometime to, right. to work, go back to Chicago. Okay, so I had this girlfriend who, Eleanor, who was my girlfriend for a good part of, high, of college. And she was thinking that she wanted to go to nursing school. So we had some kind of, I don't know, insane plan where we both came back to Chicago and she worked as like a nurse's aide at Northwestern and I worked at the women's union office. And we spent probably a year, maybe a year, like maybe it was spring semester and the whole next year, I can't really remember, remember, living in Chicago. And I worked for the women's union. She did that and we went back to Minneapolis and she ended up going into public health nursing and uh, she already had her bachelor's degree. She was a few years older than me. She moved back to Winona and got her public health nursing degree there. And one thing that struck me is that from researching you is there was a lot of publications you were writing. That I had come across Womankind, The Blazing mm -hmm. Star at CWLU, and then some stuff in Twin Cities movement mm -hmm. here in Minnesota. So I, I, you don't have to talk about each publication. What I'm really interested in is when did you realize writing was something that you were good at and that you wanted to do? So, I, I don't have an answer for that. I feel like what happened was that the general level of writing skills in the society plummeted. So mine rose up relative to <laughs> other people's. Um, but that has been consistent yeah. from very early on. I mean, now I have two dissertations on my desk now that I'm editing. I was helping people with their posters today. I mean, it's something that has carried me through. Um, it was always sort of there. So I needed to, when I, it, the women's union was very, thought that I mean, if outreach was important, we needed to have a way of getting the word out. And the reader had just started, and there, the, Eth the, eth the level of uh, publication from the ethnic presses then was far greater than now. I mean, electronic communication has, has replaced a lot of that. But Svenska Tribunen had its own publishing um, house. And the, the reader was being printed there. And the women's union had an office that was sort of adjacent to that. This is before Newsweb. I mean, actually, the guy who started Newsweb bought... Svenska Tribunen. So then their paper was printed on his equipment and the reader, I mean, that was how he, I can't remember his name right now, but. Um, what 
part of town was the so WMA it was at, at that point it was a Belmont and Clark before that it had been on Lincoln Avenue and I don't know if they went from Cermak Road to Lincoln Avenue if there was something in between you know I mean I was away at college and, and you know we were growing our own weed in a cemetery because we didn't want to be part of the drug trade so there's like pieces of like things were that either I didn't know or I don't remember. So so here you are in Chicago. You're writing for two pretty big publications. You're in mm -hmm. the heart of activism. Why do you go back to Minnesota? Well, I always felt, first of all, my family would have killed me if I hadn't graduated from college. And, I mean, I always knew I was only coming back for a while until, I mean, Eleanor was going to go back. I mean, it had never been the plan that I was going to actually drop sure. out of college. Sure. Um, you know, these these publications, Womankind, Blazing Star, they're not archived online. I couldn't find them. So, no. You have to go... Actually, you would need to talk to Chris Ridio, who understands this better, or Margaret Schmidt, who's here um, in Chicago. Christine is in um, D.C., but they're in, like, paper file boxes at the Historical Society. Chicago Historical Society? Yeah. So when the women's union dissolved, they gave everything to the historical society. Then after that, some people gave it other places, like Jenny Knauss's papers are at Loyola. Um, God, her name just flew out of my head. This woman Christine met with the last time she was here. She wants to put the stuff she has at Northwestern. But the actual things that the women's union had are all at the historical society. And they have not been digitized. Yeah. Which is a shame. They're but just I'm there. Sure one day they will be. And I think Christine might have di digitized some of it herself. Not so it's not so she has it digitally, but it's not at the historical society. I think she I think when she's been here. Because she wants to write some kind of a book. I don't know. So so here you are. You're spending your summers in wounded knee, <laughs> growing weed in a cemetery. And writing lesbian publication, The Blazing Star in Chicago, and uh, it's fast. It's it's really uh, it's really you can't. You and can't not write really than doing this. not really doing things that are overtly public public. Like I never I didn't go to demonstrations and stuff because yeah. I didn't want to like get caught by my relatives. Like a, like a double life sort of thing, or like a yeah, you know. Well, that's cheesy. What what I what I want to know is, and I think would be helpful for people who ever hear this later is. It's so easy to stereotype this is like crazy this activist from the sixties involved mm -hmm. in this. You know, what did you think do you remember what you thought of yourself at that time? Did you think of yourself as an activist? Would you have identified as as that way? Or you know, you I don't think I had that great self perspective. I mean I felt like I was doing the deal. I had gotten dumped in this shitty suburb. Yeah. You know, everybody their lives were fucked. My life was fucked by getting dumped there. Shit was hitting the fan. I was trying to make the best of it. And so you still... And I believed young. in better lives for girls. Absolutely. I mean, and I still do. You know, I mean, that was one reason why I was at work late today. You know, I, we told this one student that, okay, she has, now she has this prestigious job at, the, at Rush. When she presents next week, at the Coleman Foundation, we want it to sound like she deserved to be a Coleman Scholar, and that shouldn't be somebody she's, who is in a privileged position. So, like, how are you going to introduce yourself? So she introduces herself. She says, and Kathy Tosas, it wasn't for the Coleman Foundation. I would, like, be some poor prostitute walking the streets of Puerto Rico. <laughs> No, that's not, she knew that's not what we meant. Right, right, right. But it was like she didn't see any ground between who she's become and how she grew up. She, those, right. that, those, that change, all the things that she's done from then to now, she couldn't like back up well, a couple like of from, steps and say, right. I went to college at the University right, of Michigan right. and I was in basic science, but I decided right. that I wanted to use that knowledge to improve Things that in fact, for there had been the community. A hundred other steps in between. A hundred of them. She went for right now, second year doctoral student who works at the at Rush University at Midwest. 
Well, it Back like to growing story. up on the streets in Puerto Rico. Right, and it sounds like from your own story, even while you were in Minnesota, the idea of Cicero was still... Well, that was a pretty big thing to get over. For really? years, I wouldn't go and visit. Oh, really? I was like, no, 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 no. Been there, done. I'm done, I'm done, it's over. And then, so at some point, Morelli moved to Minneapolis. I went there first, and at some point, she moved to Minneapolis. But when she came back, she came back, her brother, who... He is a real character. He worked, He weighed like 450 pounds, and he worked at Cicero Avenue Bars at a bouncer, as a bouncer. So needless to say, he died kind of young. Yeah. So then she needed to come back from Minneapolis and take care of her mother and her aunt. And I didn't visit her for a long time out there. I was like, I'm done with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so then. But the other thing that happened was that there was this guy in my high school who was, uh, he was, uh, belonged to the Archdukes, one of the street gangs, and he, he used to hide around the corner and beat up people who, like, painted swastikas on my locker and stuff, and I wouldn't go out with him, I was like, I don't go out with gangbangers, I don't care to go out with gangbangers, you have to go out with me, you're gonna have my kids, you can do whatever you want, honey. I did it. You didn't go out with him? No, I had his kids. Oh, you had his kids. <laughs> Well, stupid. Eventually, you know. <laughs> On the list of stupid like the things movies, one could do. You just keep talent. You just keep persisting. Mm -hmm. This is why I don't want this publicly distributed. It's too insane. Oh no, I understand. I understand. So. Well, let's see. In terms. So of my, our son now lives in Barcelona. He has is the right. That Gannett, to, to no, say, this is Aaron. Or? This is Aaron. Aaron okay. He lives in Barcelona. He has the right to live and work in the EU because his father is an Italian. Wow. So he has EU citizenship. So I guess there's something good mm -hmm. came out of that, I suppose. Complete. Well. Complete craziness. Now, 1978, or 1979-ish, you're done with Minnesota. I actually did find the uh, commencement program. When you graduated, which was which was digitized online. For Better something, than, something you'll never from the high school. Which was interesting. What I found interesting is because you made you ended up with graphic arts. So at some point, I decided I was going to like have to be able to have a job yeah. and like the life of the mind, not a job. American history, probably not a job. So you got to say what you majored in. Mm. So I took a number I had done stuff related to writing and production and all of that here. Mm. There was at that time on the left a movement to have independent print shops. We had one in Minneapolis, just like Salcedo was here. We had one in Minneapolis. And I had, I mean, having Eleanor and I come here for a while helped. But in general, I mean, this was, I was a Chicagoan. I had kept up a lot of ties in Chicago. The women's movement had national ties. So even though I was in Minneapolis, I, that was a way to keep up ties. Sure. Um, so I, I learned a number of different printing skills. You'll see pictures of me running a small duplicating size printing machine at the Women's Union. Um, I never really did learn to run a larger printing machine, but um, I learned, I taught photography, I taught a number of different things. Um, I did a, um, at the Hennepin County Vocational Center, you know, Minnesota had like a state plan for how to train workers. You know, I went through that program as part of being in an experimental college. I taught in that program. I completed the number of hours you had to complete to um, teach vocational education. And there were a number of different reasons why I wanted to come back to Chicago. I mean, part of it was that I felt sort of ethnically isolated. I mean, I wasn't going to like become one. That's why Ken Tilson wanted me to do it. I wasn't going to like, you know, live on Pine Ridge. I wasn't going to go out with Indian men. and I mean, all that stuff was very controversial, and a lot of that was happening. I wasn't going to do that. You must have felt um, I mean, a little, just a little out of your element a little bit, perhaps, out there. Well, Maybe just not as much as one might think. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't going to... I understood that that was their culture and not mine. That was I was there to help them with issues that they faced. I wasn't there to, like be a groupie or, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, part of it is if you grow up in a family that has cultural dissonance, 
you're not like looking for yet another culture. Well, it's just like <laughs> you, know, how, you know, you know, they ask how the religi- religiosity and spirituality of your family kind of affects your social activism. So you felt like there was this distance between your dad being Christian. Oh, it was. It was out there. It was out there. I mean, it wasn't like something that I felt. It was openly discussed. Like, you know, families that argue about, like, you left your crap over there on the horse? Why didn't you put your clothes away? No. They argued about how the Jews gave the Assyrians a bad rap in the Jonah and the whale. Oh, my God. They are... (laughs) What what do the Assyrians do in Jonah and the whale? They were the um, heathens. Oh, jeez. And the Jews went to visit them and try to, like, get them to have a unitary God. I mean, that was the issue then. So that was dinner conversation. Yes, this is the kind of stuff that they argued about. Wow. Now, were there specific gender roles in your household growing up? As a woman, were you expected by either your dad or your mom to behave a certain way? My mother didn't set any expectations. My mother, she, like, you know, she was stuck with this kid. She had her own life. She was, like, going to do what she needed to do. I was expected to make dinner, you know. But But in my father's family, there were very strong gender roles. In a good way, you think, or in a bad way? Eh, you know, it was the deal. You know, it was the deal. I mean, you know, it's hard to say, is this good or yeah, bad, but it was de- definitely there. And this is something I think Americans don't understand, is that in these sex-segregated societies, in some ways it's better for the girls. Just like, you know, Vivian having this girls group was probably much better for me than if the Y had organized something that was by age group. You know? Because you could see a commonality there with the other women. Well, I mean, it's like look at at math achievement. Girls in all girls settings do better in math than girls in mixed settings. I mean, there's something about that we don't want to recognize. Well, maybe it's the pressures. Maybe it's like that there's something, way that people look at things the same way. So that camaraderie that we look at that on a football team that's all male, there could be something that's similar to that among girls if yeah. they're when they're sex segregated, even though it doesn't have all of that public display. Absolutely. I had loved going to Saint Scholastica because I was so happy. I you know, when I lived in my freshman girls dorm, I was one of the people that organized voting against the dorm going co ed. Wow. We don't want the dorm to go co ed. I mean it was like, oh ish. Right. I have to live here. This is like our space. Well, so now you, you know what I mean? It's like a di- it's just such a different way of looking at things. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it's true. If you have sex segregation, I mean, we've written, there's tomes written about this in terms of racial segregation. In terms of how, you know, how sometimes having those all black communities isn't as bad as one might think, that, that it allows for certain things that an integrated Absolutely. community doesn't allow for. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. so there's, there's different sides to, to this. That's very interesting. So, so by now, you graduated college. Whether you're thinking it or not, you've definitely been involved in a lot of activism. Mm-hmm. Have you developed at this time... Uh, you talk, we've talked a lot about the importance of women's issues, but have you developed at this time a, what would you, a philosophy of social activism? Is there an idea about... I think everybody in, nobody out is probably the philosophy. I think that's one of the things I brought to the women's union, one of the things I argued for in the women's union, that you, know, you have to... All inclusive. It has to be inclusive. If you're going to have change, it has to be inclusive. That's a necessary but not sufficient condition. But inclusivity is a necessary condition. Wow. That's, a, that's great. When you get back in Chicago, you do vocational training in Chicago State, even though you have tons of vocational training mm. already. Huh? So, I didn't know what I wanted to do. 
I mean, I knew I wanted to come home. I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. And I can't remember exactly how I found out about it, but Chicago State at that time, it was still pre- it was already predominantly black, but there had been a history in Chicago where the Board of Education had its own set of requirements for teachers. And two schools had the franchise on those courses, Chicago State and Northeastern Illinois. So it was a huge teacher training institute. So I had thought if I didn't want to be in Minnesota, I needed to get teaching credentials. So I would go to Chicago State in a graduate pro, some kind of graduate program. I would do that. I would work there while I was doing that. Well, this whole thing completely fell apart. I mean, the reasons why it fell apart are like, there's a gazillion of them. But... I know, it's a tough one, though, if you don't want Right. Well, no. I mean, it's interesting, because some of it is about gender. Mm-hmm. It's also about... I mean, Minnesota is a progressive place in a lot of ways, even if they elect people like Michelle Bachman. They have a one- and five-year plan for occupational outlook. I mean, they... They, in, in, in a way that Illinois doesn't, value a certain amount of planning mm-hmm. and pu- public dollars are used for public planning for the public good and this and that. So in Minnesota, you only taught subjects that you had occupational experience in. And I had managed in all those years uh, going to college yeah. <laughs> to gain a lot of occupational experience. Yeah. I came to Illinois, and I didn't understand this when I came, and... I was going to be expected to teach all of the occupations that came under the state classification of trades and industry. So that included, like, auto shop, really. So that whole thing basically was a failure. I mean, I got some good experience there and this and that. And, you know, so it was still predominantly black. The faculty certainly wasn't. I mean, I think now... If you look back, now there's enough people who have faculty credentials that are bl- who are black that they have a largely black faculty. Yeah. The faculty was basically white. So I taught there. I took some classes. I did this and that. I pretty much failed at student teaching. I couldn't control the students. I mean, of course, they sent me to Montefiore, which wasn't helpful, which is where they sent all the JD kids, the yeah. de- de- yeah. delinquents. This is before we had alternative schools. But wow. the department had been held, one of the compliance issues with the State Board of Education was that they had not updated their safety curriculum after the passage of OSHA in 1970. So I volunteered to do that. And that's really what I took forward from there. Before I came to the university in public health, I worked in manufacturing. Yeah, I, I, I have, I have a, a couple of the and That's oh, really absolutely. what I took forward occupationally from Chicago State was occupational health and safety. Well, so after college, it seems like you did a lot. You you worked for a while for the Neighborhood Works. Mm-hmm. Or the, the, uh, neighborhood, the Center for Neighborhood Technology. And wrote the Neighborhood Works. You became a consultant with the City of Chicago Department so of Economics. So I did some writing, but a lot of these p- positions, I was also like the production person because I had the graphic arts skills. Mm-hmm. Um, so what happened, I mean, I think, I can't remember if in these times came before or after CNT, but at a certain point, somebody said to me, look, at, you should be doing more writing and editing and less production. One of our customers did it in these times, and I can't remember the, organi- the order of activity, if that was before. I think it, before, I think it was before CNT. Because CNT had this whole program where they provided technical assistance to manufacturing. And that was how I got into uh, managing health and safety programs. And they had a manufacturer who contacted them, who hired one of the um, environmental engineers who worked at CNT. So he left CNT to go there, and he took me with him. I was under the impression you were writing for the neighborhood works. I did some writing, but my entree into it was still that I had the production skills. And did this fit in with your idea of activism as well? 
um, a little bit. It also fit into my idea about like how I wanted to structure my work life and have a family. Because I wanted things that were more flexible than like working at the Sun Times or something. So it did both. So you had regular hours there? Mm -hmm. You had regular hours, but there was stuff you could do at home. You know, if it was your day to drop kids off, you could come later. I mean, just like at the university. You know, Wednesday's my day to drive the munchkins. I don't get to work until 10 o'clock. No one cares. You know, so, so it was sort CNT of... CNT offered you that kind of... Yeah, CNT had that same sort of... But it was still activism in a way. It was still activism. Technology and environment, right? But the... Um, how much of it had to do with the activism and how much of it had to do with it being, you know, like a family-friendly place to work, I think that it sort of all melted together for me. Well, I have one friend right now who's writing his paper, seminar paper for another class on CNT. Mm -hmm. He told me yesterday in class, and I said, you know what, I'm interviewing somebody oh, who's that work interesting? CNT tomorrow. And... I said, do you want me to ask her a specific question? He says, no, because I don't want to put my bias on He's like, I just want you to ask her about CNT and see what she says. So but this was a very long time ago. I mean, CNT was downtown and moved to North Avenue while I worked there. That's how long ago this was. And they're still, still around today. They're still around. Um, I, over the years, Steve Perkins has done a, taken a bigger role. Um, well, how would you characterize your experience working? You were there for six years, right? Mm -hmm. It's long, kind of a long time. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was a good place for me to be. I, I mean, I disagreed with them on the fact that they viewed health and health care as not in their wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. They didn't see it as a issue, as a sort of social mm -hmm. environment issue, the same way that they saw transportation and other things. I mean, I always thought they were wrong about that. Um, I thought they were that when they looked at issues in manufacturing and protecting manufacturing, some of the stuff that was happening around the um, administrative requirements and occupational health and safety, they didn't seem to see that as, as key. And, you know, they saw the environmental as much more key. And on the one hand, they were right, but on the other... environment, are they thinking most about air quality or... Well, air quality, but the big issue in manufacturing then, and really what caused manufacturing to leave here after NAFTA was passed, was more around um, land pollution and water pollution. Chicago River. Um, so. Well, groundwater, Chicago River, the expenses of like not just being able to stick whatever industrial waste you had whether it was sticking it in your backyard or sticking it in the creek or sticking it in wherever, but having to do some kind of treatment within the plant, um, how cumbersome it was and how expensive it was. Um, so so air pollution, it's a huge issue in the city, but when you look at manufacturing, um, the air issues aren't evenly distributed in the different manufacturing settings. So like in... Um, Plating, circuit board manufacturing, food, which were the ones I worked in, air pollution was not nearly as big of an issue as what you did with waste. water that you discharged or with hazardous waste. How those were regulated, what all the rules were, and you know the pressures to cut costs because of what was going on in terms of manufacturing capabilities in other countries. So you were under a pressure to have your products be cheaper, and at the same... So, so you got, like, food manufacturers, for example, mm -hmm. and then CNT is sort of a buffer between them and the government? Or is... What CNT so I think that's for? more true now. I think they have moved more towards um, systems analysis and po policy change. They were really providing technical assistance. This is how your plant can comply with these rules. We'll help you figure that out. This is what you need to do. I think over time they have moved much more towards um, looking at systems and policies. So at the time they were helping manufacturers mm -hmm. comply. And at the time there were hundreds of small manufacturers. 
You know, it's a very, Goose Island was still a manufacturing hub then. I mean, it was very. It was a very with, different time. Would you meet with these manufacturers? No, personally? that's not what I did. Mm -hmm. I worked on the neighborhood works. Yeah. So who read the neighborhood works? So this filtered down to the neighborhood works in terms of what our um, news and editorial priorities were. So there were things I thought were going on that were hugely important that they didn't really see as as part of well their priority or as part of their agenda. Um, so this was but I was really just like, you know, like right, it was the mouthpiece and and Tom Clark, by the Tom Clark, who went on to found the community uh, media project, he, um, he was the, you know, I worked under him, and then when he left under Mary O'Connell, we won Lissiger Awards, I mean, it was well regarded. Um, it was a you have to remember, there wasn't, like, um, electronic journalism now. It was sort of like the work they did now would be, like, a high-quality blog today. But it was before any of that. And so the manufacturers themselves read the neighborhood works? Sometimes, and, and they sometimes they were featured in it, and, uh -huh. and sometimes activists read it, policy people. I mean, I think they were as interested, if not more interested, in having policy people. Harold Washington was mayor. I mean, it was a whole different time. Right. Um, and so this was seen so as the stuff I did with a the city. Or pro a progressive organization? Sort of I think you would say progressive. Clean up kind of thing, attitude? Um, Clean up the manufacturing? Well, and also um, diffusion of innovation. That there were there were a lot of innovations, technical or technological and other innovations that had occurred that I mean it's sort of the same thing we talk about in healthcare now where there's a disparity between who gets the digital mammograms, who gets the old mammograms. It was sort of like the same sort of thing. Which businesses there's some sort of preferential treatment. So some bis some sectors of business and manufacturing are getting these innovations and the others are, you know, just trotting along, doing it the old way, losing competitive edge. They actually control a tremendous number of jobs. I mean, at, at the time, I mean, Chicago, um, metal fabrication in Chicago, many, many, many thousands of people worked in metal fabrication. The steel mills were in the south side. There were all sorts of metal fabrication jobs here, and those people were, they were small shops, they were under a tremendous amount of scrutiny, they were being required to apply, uh, re to uh, comply so with things, was, um, mm -hmm. they wanted to, to be them. like the interface. They wanted to talk up about how maybe we should be doing these things this way, and they wanted to talk down and say, look it, we'll help you so that you can survive this new regulatory environment. Sounds like a good mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. They were still interested in things like transportation, um, but they hadn't yet. I think now, and I haven't kept track of them that much, but I think they have taken a more systems approach over the years than then. A less, by, by you know, amassing data to say this is on the like meta level. This is this is a change that's needed. Rather than saying we'll we'll help you case by case basis, right? Talks. We'll help you advocate to keep those bus lines. We'll we'll help you comply. Comply. Now it's almost more academic, maybe. I don't know if academic is fair, but I mean, like they have, they have, they made their street cred. They can go to city council meetings mm -hmm. and they can say, I you see know, see. getting rid of X Y Z bus line will mean this. This kind of transportation reform will will allow this kind of economic growth. I mean, they're just, it's like a different, Did you ever? Um, maybe more think tanky and less technical assistance. That might be, I mean, I'd be interested in what your friend finds, but that, yeah, well, that but it. that might I'll be the, you. but I mean, that might be the um, way to describe the change. I'm not sure. Did, did you ever, um, did your job at CNT ever to take you back full circle to Cicero? No. Did you ever have any industry mm -mm. manufacturers? No, I was, Thank I mean, God. I worked for the Neighborhood Works. I did the Neighborhood Works. I wasn't. Mostly in-house. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like anybody was going to ask me where I thought the bodies were buried. <laughs> and, you know, 
I would have had opinions on that, but... So I guess the next thing, um, Rudy Lozano? Uh, yeah. Now, I mean, you don't have to expand on this a lot if you don't want to. It's in, in your biographical sheet here. Okay. It seems like you so, say that this was... I'm working at Chicago State. Benito Juarez High School has decided that they're going to have a trades and industry track. It's going to be on graphic arts. I've, been, I've maintained friendships with all the people at, at Salcedo Press. So people at Juarez call the people at Salcedo Press and they say, we need somebody to teach in this after-school program at Kasatzan because we want our students to hit blah, 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 blah. So people at Salcedo call me. And as the one woman said, Marilyn said, you're the only person I could think to call. I told her after this, if I'm the only person that you can think to call, don't call anyone. But anyway, so they have this, like, after-school program that costs us long. That, that was a rockin' hood at that time. I mean, it was like a happening place. And I ran an after-school graphic arts program. They had set type, make you know, get copied ready was all done very differently then. It was very labor intensive. So the neighborhood was able to have posters and flyers and leaflets that they themselves could produce and all they had to pay for was the actual printing. They didn't have to pay someone to get all of that stuff done. The kids got a, um, got experience doing that. I can't remember the name of the guy who was like a um, a local artist who did um, murals and all that, who worked with them in terms of the art stuff. He's a little older than me. I think he's still around. I can't remember his name. But anyway, so that was at, that was at Kasatzan. So I'm working at Chicago State. I'm doing the deal at Kasatzan. I don't know. It was interesting. I mean, part of it is you have to like go back and say. My father always said, "Your job is you're the bridge from the old world to the new world." So, like, if somebody asked me to do this at Kasatzan, I wouldn't have been able to say no. Kasatzan was a, it's still there, was a community organization on 18th Street. That's a really interesting, for who and what type of people went there? Oh, it was all Mexicans. It was. That's, and that's how you met Lozano. So, then Rudy decides, I mean, he was from the hood, he decides to run for office, and, you know. I mean, there must, there must, I think there was some piece of me that wasn't, like, totally on board that this was, like, my role in the world, some of this stuff. But, I mean, it would have been great to get him elected. But, um, you know, it's an interesting saying. You know, said, it's the time, it's Lincolnshire versus Cicero, yeah. you know what I mean? It's a bunch, there's a bunch there. <laughs> I mean, your dad's saying this is the this is the bridge from the old world to the new world, and that's, that's really what I've done. That's fascinating. That's really what I've done in my life. I went to the psychiatrist for a while, and I used to say to, I'd say to him, I'd say, you know, this is the problem. The bridge is getting really saggy. <laughs> Too fucking many people have crossed this bridge. <laughs> she needs a well, break. You made it a you made it a, an effort. Mm -hmm. To really help um, immigrants. I still do. I mean, like this thing today. I can't believe that Kathy said that. I'm like, oh my god. But she couldn't, like, on the spot, take it from not here and now, uh -huh. two or three steps backwards. It was really interesting. Yeah. And the fact that they need to make this presentation next Saturday wow. made it less interesting and more like, shoot me now. But it was kind of interesting. One of the questions that they ask is, um, oh, now I'm, now I'm just blanking. A lot of these questions are, oh, yeah, this is the one. So now historians look back at this time and they say this is the second wave feminist. Mm -hmm. right? At the time, was there a knowledge of this? And did you have it as being in your 20s? So, in the Women's Union, 
the part I was involved in was so much about everybody in, nobody out, and outreach, and this and that, and better lives for girls. We can, make, we can do this. That, I mean, not everyone called themselves feminists. I mean, there was a sense that, you know, there was a women's movement, there was a black power movement, there was an anti-war movement. All these movements needed to come together. There was Puerto Rican liberation. All these movements needed to come together. And the word feminist and words, feminist and feminism, were less utilized. I mean, we talked about socialist feminism when we talked about, like, a structural analysis of what we were going to do or what we were doing. And they relied on this on uh, Juliet Mitchell's work that way. And that was very deliberately discussed, but we weren't as, in a, as much a part of some of those discussions about, like, what is feminism? And even the lesbian organizing, it wasn't about um, separatism in the way that a lot of the women's movement was. And I think that's uh, largely because if you look towards people like Heather and Vivian, it was everybody in, nobody out. It wasn't, you know, it was supposed to be inclusive. The boat was supposed to be big enough so that that kind of separatism thing. As I remember it, I mean, I wish, I wish we were doing this interview with both me and Christine because yeah. she's a number of years older than me. She was in graduate school when I was in high school. I um, you know, she's a. I, it's not like a, a contra. A, um, a, I would say a different perspective. I don't think they're mm -hmm. in conflict, but I mean, she well, we she was able to sort of fly ahead above a little bit from it than I was. Yeah. Um, I don't know, she had she worked in the YDFL in college before she came here and joined the women's movement. I mean, it was a whole different thing then. But that's one of the interesting things about you is that um, compared to a lot of the other women list, you're younger than them in terms of the age you were when this movie was going on. I mean, there are plenty of interviews that will be, that other people are getting from women who are 30 when you were 16. You know, mm -hmm. but it's, but I, mean, I know. I well, and I mean, I, I think Vivian was probably 25. Yeah, much older than you when you were. But like, you know, if you're 16 and somebody's 25, that's like like really that's really old. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Plus, exactly. she like had lived all these places and done mm -hmm. all these things, and like we were fucking stuck in this yeah. Verstuken neighborhood. Yeah. You know. And somehow she had come to you guys. And somehow she had come to us. This was like, like extraordinarily cool. Now you said in your biographical statement, you said like something along the lines of when Rudy Lozano got killed. That that on my birthday on in front of his children, I was like, okay. Now, do you think that I that, give, that's it, I'm done. I mean, you're, I'm still like, a, you're still an activist today. I mean, the stuff you do at UIC is still. Yes. So it's not like. But, it, and I'll make phone calls through Move, move On, mm -hmm. but I haven't been politically active in the way of a lot of the, I mean, you know, you look at Diane Fager, she's on the planning committee for, for this climate change stuff and all of that. I haven't worked on a political campaign. I mean, if, if you were running for office, you wanted me to make phone calls for me, and you called me, it's not like I would say, no, I don't do politics. Right. But, I mean, I haven't. But that was a it was huge like, turning that point. Was, that was a huge like, turning point for that you. That was it. I'm done. I'm done. I got my Schwarzkopf painted up my locker. I got the garage burned down when I was in high school. Now this guy gets and killed now, in yeah. front of his kids at breakfast. That's okay. And now you're 31. You know, it's like you're older now. You have a family. Right. Have... That's okay. Did you ever get married, by the way? Yeah. Okay, there was uh, something I couldn't find online. Yeah. Yeah, just couldn't... For all my detective work, you know, <laughs> I was wondering, because one of the questions asks, how does your family influence your activism? Did you relate? So, Bob, Aaron's father, he was a syndicalist. So he was like what in this country would is like an ultra leftist. And um, still pretty much is, but I mean, it plays out differently in Europe. I mean, syndicalism in Europe um, is a lot more mainstream than it ever was here. So, you know, it's... I, I actually haven't heard the word. Oh, okay. But so you guys mesh pretty well on politically. 
Well, we grew up together. I mean, we, you know, we went to high school together. We saw a lot of the same shit hit the fan. Yeah. You know, and, and still, all the different things have hit, that have happened in intervening years, if I talk to him, you know, that that is still there. And I think it has more to do with the fact that we observe the same things and that we're both pretty smart. Um, so we came to some of the same conclusions. It's sort of like the salience of the conclusions. He's coming at it from a little different position because of the European piece, which I don't have any access to. Being a male, probably. Well, well and being a male, right. But I mean that... Um, in this country, being a syndicalist, like being a communist, was a way of isolating yourself from the mainstream. That wasn't true in Italy. In Italy, it was almost the opposite. It's all, in many, many historical periods, it was the opposite. Yes. So, you know, that, that whole thing, it just plays out differently in terms of, like, how you think about yourself. Sure. You're, you know, it's a different, it's, it's very different than here. And, you know, and he's a male and sure. all of those different things. Are you and him still together? Oh, God, no. No. No, he left when Aaron was three. He decided, first he announced he was going to be a professional Dago, and I was like, mm, that sounds like really bad. Dago is there like a... In, yeah, that's like slang for Italian. He joined the Cicero Gun Club. Oh. I and then, you know, he decided he was going to be a professional Dago, and then he decided to go back home. And I was like, you're quitting your job at DePaul. You have no job there. I don't speak the language. Um, like, I still baby that I'm nursing, I don't, mm. nah, the, I don't think this is happening. <laughs> so now you were, that was like too far, I mean too far out even for me. <laughs> have a chance to go to Italy though, coming cool, whatever. Mm -hmm. You, you, um, you were interviewed in 1986, so you must have known even then at only the age of 34 that what you had been involved in was important. Did you oh, have I a think, sense of that? Like, that you in a way, a it probably history? seemed more important to me then than it does now. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so much other shit is yeah. in the pan since then, you know. I mean, you look back on what you're doing now in graduate school. It all seems so minor right. in the bigger picture. But it's interesting to be in a... Because in a, um, you've been interviewed a few times since then mm -hmm. as well. There was a couple ones Well, because I'm so easy to find. Yeah. There was a book called um, Provoking Agents. In 1995, you're, this might be news to you, you're, you're cited in there. Several really? Times. Who There's wrote a, that? Um, well, I, you know what? I can go into my 82. notes here. And I can Aaron was 13? Actually, I can't believe I talked to There's another one called Finding the Movement. Oh, yeah. That. You're cited in that book several times. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess the author conducted an, an interview with you there. So, I mean, people were reaching mm -hmm. out to you. People were interested in this, in your relationship with, I imagine that, mm -hmm. that it was CWOU that got mm -hmm. you. So, I mean, they weren't seeking you out to ask you about, you know, Minnesota and about no. Pine Ridge. And... Yeah, let's see. I do think a part of it is that I'm easy to find, and part of it is that, you know, I was a high school kid who got involved in this stuff. I mean, SDS set out and said, we need to organize working class youth. Vivian gets herself a job at the Cicero Y, and here we are. How'd you get the job at UIC? Well, this is interesting because, I mean, part of this goes to sort of like the whole, at some way, and I think this comes out of a Syrian culture, but, um, the importance of connections and staying connected. So as an undergraduate, I had studied anthropology, humanities, a variety of different things. I kept those connections to that sort of like, academic discipline even though I wasn't around. Um, we had a parent-run play group when the kids were little and one of the people in it was Michael Lieber um, who was an anthropology professor at UIC. 
Um, and I met a variety of, you know, through those contacts, I met other anthropologists. He had had, um, I can't remember his name, but Susan Scrimshaw's father as a, as a professor. And um, Susan Scrimshaw, at a certain point, was our dean. She was an anthropologist. She was the dean of the UIC School of Public Health. And she hired me. I was where NAFTA had been passed. So, like, the shit was hitting the fan in manufacturing in Chicago. Those jobs were going to be gone. Chicago was going to be a place that produced prototypes. We weren't going to have 250 employees and doing these million-piece runs to make. Manufacturing was, it being, was leaving Chicago. It was leaving Chicago. That was the impact of NAFTA locally. They so, buy just manufactured goods from Latin America. Or? Well, you at least move the production facility offshore. So you avoid the you get lower wages. I mean, the union busting had already happened. Lower taxes, right? You get lower. Well, but the big savings was on um, environmental compliance. So like across the border in Mexico, you were able to go back to just direct discharge of, you know, potassium cyanide, potassium permanganate, nitric acid, whatever. Which is awful for... Yes. It's awful, right? It was awful. And as someone who had I mean, that was something the Center of Neighborhood Technology would have seen as awful as well, right? You know, and I wonder if... They can go back and look at their strategies and say, if we had done this instead of that, maybe it wouldn't have turned out the same. Or if they would have just said no. There were global forces at work. You know, we stayed the course. We allowed people to survive longer than they would have survived right. without us. Right. But these, you know, these global forces were too strong for what... I mean, because in a way they were a band-aid, and I don't want to say this as if I, I'm putting them down, sure, sure, but in a way sure. they were a band-aid program. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, the federal government, the, the changes that were happening at that high level were not something that the CNT had a major influence on. Well, and... In terms of NAFTA, right? Things there like would have had to be a top-down national strategy to say... There are ways to achieve environmental compliance and maintain profitability. I mean, that's what they've done in Europe. They've said these are the governmental supports that are in place so that these local businesses can contribute to the common good. We don't really believe in the common good in this country, so you're certainly not going to have government programs that help an individual business contribute to the common good. We don't believe, we don't understand that. It's a shame. You know, that whole thing has flown out of our, of our heads. So, I agree with you, absolutely. Um, in terms of... But anyway, uh, one of these so I was just extremely lucky that, that Susan Scrimshaw offered me this job. Oh, yeah. And you've been there ever since, 17 years, maybe, mm -hmm. something like that? Yeah, something like that. Like 98, maybe 99. Yeah, yeah. And you no, know, you've moved up for so many, you were project coordinators, this and this mm -hmm. and this. So, if you want to look like, see, what are the common threads? I mean, in occupational health and safety, a huge piece of it is training programs for workers. When you use your hearing, why you want to protect your ears, when you use your hearing protection, if you're doing this, you need that kind, if you're so doing you, this, you so can just, you know, all that stuff. When you get the job and you watch the mm -hmm. video, you know, mm -hmm. in the training, that's something you would produce, or you would talk to the producers mm -hmm. of, or you would... You know, all of that stuff, and so that's like sort of an add-on curriculum from working in the plant. Here we are, add-on curriculum to pre-doctoral education. You, you're in a cancer epi program, but you're really interested in breast cancer. We have this to offer you that's mm -hmm. intensive breast cancer mm -hmm. situated within. I mean, so you can sort of look at it, take that longitudinal view. Because manufacturing and safety and, right. and occupations. 
safety right. in the workplace. Right. Teaching safety in the workplace. Right. Or, 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 yeah, no, and developing indivi developing individuals, you know, the being the bridge. I mean, I mostly worked on minority for focus programs, so being the bridge, you know, there's many things between and where you are now and being the kid running the streets in Puerto Rico. You know, I mean, like... And compliance is an important thing for immigrants to learn. Or for minorities well, to learn. and why don't people comply? You know, we were talking about this in the Monday seminar. I mean, we know that in these super disadvantaged communities, and if you talk to people about women, but why they don't get mammograms, and these are the recommended mammograms, they were like, well, but that's not for us. They don't feel, because they're not part of the deal. They don't feel like they're part of the deal. So they think even those rules are about somebody else. They're not about them. It's not, you know, it's so still it's that everybody that in, people. nobody out. We haven't achieved that in right. anything, so even. That, that idea of inclusivity, of everybody in, that's followed you from CISRA, mm -hmm. from the CWAU, too. Mm -hmm. And have you seen Well, I mean, if you think of it, it goes back to being the bridge. Which you've often told you. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Those are like the continuous streams. And, and have, we've always put women at the forefront there. Mm -hmm. How does your work for women manifest itself at UIC? I mean, you well, that's like a funny question met. because, yeah. you know, these occupations are so dominated by women now. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't think they're... The uh, behavioral the, health seminar, there isn't one male trainee. There was one who signed up who never materialized. So it's like other, you know, sort of like there's other forces at work. We have a male trainee in the Coleman program this year. He's a, actually a breast surgeon who decided he wanted to learn epidemiology and become a researcher, but it's just been female-dominated. Good thing. Not, but, I mean, not by design. It just has been. Um, I've worked in programs that weren't female-dominated, but primarily they all are now. I mean, I mean, it's a luxury for a man to get a Ph.D. and do some of the work that we do at UIC, they need to earn more money. There's, you know, I mean, it's sort of like part of like a, the meta level of a mommy trap. What do you think that women from the from the 60s that you worked with, the 70s that you knew, would think if they'd seen that today? You no, know, I don't know. I mean, I think that... Um, would, they have these, would they be surprised at all the improvement? Would they see it as progress? Well, I think people understand, I mean, this is sort of a, which is the ancillary issue and which is the core issue, I'm not sure, but we all know that part of the reason why the wage differential between men and women has gone, has closed, is that the male wage has dropped. <laughs> that, that's closed the gap. The female wage has gone up a little bit, but the male, I mean, you know, we went from where there was something, there was a concept of what a family wage was, and that was owned by, earned by men. And when you went to the two wage earner family, male needed less because you know it wasn't like, like that much of a gain for a family. But you know that wasn't our that wasn't our intent. That you were going to be a working, or no? Oh no. You thought you might be a housewife or might be a stay-at-home mom? Well, I was living in Cicero, running on the streets and all that, and my grandmother was, was interviewing men to take me back home to be a proper wife. <laughs> there was all sorts of shit going on. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> it's like... You know, sort of like Kathy today who can't go from, I'm this poor Puerto Rican girl, and I wouldn't have any shoes right. on my feet if I didn't have, if I wasn't a Coleman trainee. <laughs> so like, like, you see these two ads, you don't see the middle part. I mean, it was sort of hard to see the middle part. But it must feel nice to know that being in academia, you get to, you still get to interact with people like this one. Mm-hmm. But I did it There's in industry, too. Yeah. I did it in industry. I mean, those industries were pro predominantly, not pre predominantly female, but predominantly minority. Yeah, and immigrant as well. It's and crazy. immigrant as well. A lot of people who didn't have college educations. or Certainly not college educations. But Maybe I mean, not even. 
So, I, mean, I remember one day at work, this unmarked white van pulls into the parking lot. So what do you think happens inside the plant? Everybody runs out the back door. They figured it was immigration. It was oh actually my. the DuPage Department of Public Health van that does like uh, chest x-rays because they had heard that there was an, a TB outbreak. And I said to them, I said, you guys, you can't be like running around in an unmarked white van. <laughs> like everybody's, they're not stupid people. They're all gonna run away. They all ran out the dark door. Great story. But, you, you know. Yeah, I see that now. I see one thing here. Occupational health and safety coordinated with electronic support systems. You talked yeah, about that. That was a huge play. That was that was a real that was sort of like the Cicero setting of the eighties for me. That was like a wild place. Well so you did a lot of uh so, in, so then, since you got into USC, you've published a lot. I saw mm -hmm. some articles you've done. I saw this book on um, transition from welfare to work. Mm -hmm. And so... That was a huge project. I guess my question is, do you feel like the publishing is just something you do as part of being in academia? Or do you see that as, do you like doing that? Do you, do you see publishing Well, I'm writing? good at it. I wouldn't say I like it, but I'm good at it. And especially, I think, at a public institution, it's your requirement. I mean, we're paid by public funds, whether it's a state, the residents of the state of Illinois or it's federal funds or whatever. We're, I, I feel strong a sort giving of back sense. requirement. Yes, giving back, Parti you know, uh, participating in creating a public record. Yes. Giving voice to voices that wouldn't be heard before. I mean, I just feel like it's our responsibility. So there is a very so there is that a social activist aspect. Yeah, I mean that publishing. there's yes, and I I mean I tell students that that the value of their work is most strongly correlated with how it's disseminated. It doesn't have like some you know. Then you write the greatest thing, but if no one other the if they thing. don't understand that, then they might as well. Go and, you know, study the Greeks. They're in public health. This is a government, public health is a government responsibility. More than other, more than other yeah. disciplines that are more academic. Yes. Public health is about yes. opportunity, creating opportunity for the public eventually. I mean, well, if it doesn't trickle down, then it didn't do what it was. Yes, what yes, it was absolutely. Do. It's our responsibility. And... So environmental and neighborhood technology, manufacturing, to public health and cancer. You've been... They're more connected than you might think, though. Yeah. And we have problems making the con connections. But if you think about it, those environmental discharges are connected to cancer. Yes, absolutely. You know. And access to I mean, who can live in what neighborhoods based so on... So I've had three friends who've died of cancer... One, her parents were um, missionaries. She grew up in Africa. The other two, two were from the neighborhood in Chicago called Bubbly Creek. It was called Bubbly Creek because there was so much industrial discharge into the oh, gross. Yeah. into this little tributary into the Chicago River that it bubbled, and the kids played around there. So those are the. I mean, in my just like. Small little world, that's two of the three people who've died of cancer in my life. So health, so for you, um, health was directly related to how manufacturers treat the environment and to how... <laughs> I think so. I mean, we, there's a variety of reasons why we can't prove that. There's a variety of reasons. I mean, it has to do with how we've constructed uh, notions of proof has to do with the fact that we don't have a national health service so we can't track the, the health issues people have had we can't track their residencies over a number of years so we don't know if they die of pancreatic cancer at age 60 mm -hmm. what are the common exposures among other people who died of pancreatic cancer at the age at age 60 because we don't keep those sort of records in this country so we can only, like, do the kind of postulating you can do after two glasses of wine. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't, we can't create a way. There was a lot of 
talk lately about um, plants on the south side and the air quality and uh, for children who are going to school. Mm-hmm. There's even been campaigns at bus stops, you know, right. with faces of children saying it. But it hasn't been handled. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so more visible, at least to me. Mm-hmm. But, um, well, asthma is easier than cancer. Because right. asthma, you right. sniff it, <coughs> that Easy is... It's it's much easier to correlate. But the origins of cancer are pretty hard to prove. In general, right. right. Well, and we don't keep data in such a way to facilitate looking at that and trying to find out find the answers. I mean, you know, in, in the National Health Service in in the UK, they know where you lived when you were born, where you lived when you got your first immunizations. Where you lived when you had your tonsils out, where you lived when you had your baby. So they can look back and say, let's look at all the babies who were born between 1980 and 1985 who lived with downwind from plant Z. Yeah. Yeah. We can't do that in this country. We don't have that data. I mean, and people don't understand that that's, that's part of the reason to have something like a National Health Service. Is so that we can answer those. Questions. So that we can, we have a way of answering questions like that. But you, you believe though that cancer is caused by these. I think that there's a tremendous environmental component. You know, and if you look at the European experience and versus the U.S. experience and trajectories in certain cancers, I mean, there's always going to be as 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 life expectancy increases, all cancer is going to increase. As treatment improves, cancer, you know, all that stuff is going to go up mm-hmm. for reasons other than what's originally causing it. You know, I mean, like, there's a yeah. lot of cancers that... Cancer can be caused by one element but exacerbated by one. Well, or you can be treated for one thing and the side effect is a cancer 20 years later. So do you believe cancer and this kind of questions concerning cancer is one of the biggest issues facing women in women's health? No. I think that it's um, one of the biggest sort of scientific conundrums mm-hmm. because of how we, on, how, what our notions of proof are and how, what data is available to us in this country. No, I think if you want to think about women's health, you need to think about things like, you know, Hobby Lobby and... We don't have to provide contraception and some of the stuff around abortion and whether or not we can say, yes, there is a moral side to abortion and every individual woman needs to make a moral choice. You know, that doesn't mean that abortion needs to be av- shouldn't be available. Mm-hmm. You know, people need to make a moral choice, right. just like we need to make moral choices about all, all, sorts, sorts, of all sorts of things. All sorts of things on an everyday basis. Yes, on an everyday basis. And we trust humans to make them for themselves because we know that. Well, this is the country that has the doctrine of the individual, so the individual should be making the moral choice. Well, so if you could go back and talk to yourself when you're cis, when you're at Cicero, you're sixteen, you're hanging out with Vivian Rothstein. Now, what would you tell yourself? Then so, or in college. So before I moved to Cicero. The nuns at St. Scholasticus told me, do not go. Come and live with us. We will take care of you. I think I should have done that. Even for the person that living in Cicero made you? Well, you know, it's very hard. I mean, unless you want to be a bitter person, it's very hard to say, I completely reject all those things that happened to me. But at the same time, I think I would have been a more successful individual in a different setting. You never would have been. You may never have met Miss Rothstein. There's a lot of things that wouldn't have happened to me. Some of them, it's like I made the best of a lot of things that happened to me. Sure. But, you know, I could have lived a different life where I didn't have to keep making the best out of things. Right. And, I mean, I've done well making the best out of them. I don't fault myself for that, but, you know, there's a different way to go. There would have been a different life for me. That I think I might have been more successful at. So how that like translates into every day, I hate shopping. Okay. 
So I usually don't have very many pairs of shoes because it's really yeah. hard to buy shoes online. Because you can't find the shoes. You pay. can't really buy shoes online. You really have to try them on. And my feeling is I should be living in Highland Park and have a personal shopper. Yeah. I'll sit on my couch and somebody else will go shop. That's like who I was meant to be in this universe, but no. That didn't uh, so happen. You said you're getting interviewed we on a regular moved, basis about your We moved to Cicero. To we did not move to Highland Park. So, like, this whole other, like, life developed for me. And I don't want to say, mm. it's not, not that I don't have ownership over that life. Sure, sure. That, I, that would be facetious for me to say. But even now, thinking you were involved in CWW, mm -hmm. which is an organization that... Um, who decides which organizations become more famous than others? But this is mm -hmm. an organization that has gone down in history. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like that was a major, that's a major, to be part of something that's that major? Would you trade that? See, you know, that's the difference between talking to someone who was 16 and someone who was 26. The people who were 26 made a conscious choice to do it. I don't feel like I made some conscious well, you came choice. Back from college. I came but that back. That was because of your friend. Well, no, it wasn't just that. It was my deal then. By that time, I mean, that's what I had been doing. You know, it was part of my life. I mean, you know, when you get involved that young, you get involved in a different way than if you're older and you say, I'm going to choose this, not that. Right, right. It has a much more sort of. Um, continuous development viewpoint for me right. than I think it did for some of the people who were older and said, I'm doing that. That's what I'm picking. I mean, it's not like there were other options on the table. It's not like I could pick this, this, or this. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know? Um, you know, it's just, I mean, and that's a... That's a developmental issue. That's not a political issue. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's person. just like a developmental issue of how... I mean, like, Christine saw it entirely differently. She knew that when, you know, when she found out about the women's union, that this was what she wanted to be part of. You know, but she was a graduate student. Yeah. It, was complete, it was just completely a completely different setting than it was for me. Does it, uh, does it bother you sometimes that you have this? I mean, people know you're involved in CWLU. Do they ask you about it a lot? Does it bother no. you? Most people don't know. Yeah. No one at the university knows. What, here's a good question. What do you think CWLU's lasting impact was? Well, it certainly trained a cadre of people who did many different things after the union ended. I mean, they were union activists, they were political activists, they were people like me, they raised girls differently yeah. than other people did. I mean, it was sort of like, if you think about the fusion of innovation, you know, if you think about that, I mean, I think all of us took that experience forward into whatever sector we went into. And if you think about the, like, everybody in, nobody out, tendency or precept in the women's union, that's sort of what what you would expect as an outcome. Going into the kind of jobs you went into, you carry Well, or like, you know, Susie thing. Gam, you know, she really became a leader in disability rights. She was a lawyer by training, but she really became a leader. She played that role in a variety of different sectors. And you went into minority health and immigration. You know, and I have, I mean, I might not have that national stature, stature that someone like she does or someone like Heather does, but, you know, I've slogged away at the same thing year after year after year, and I don't regret any of those years that I've done that. So, like, when I say, you know, I should have, have a personal shopper and live in Highland Park, all that, it's not like I have a regret about the, any of the things that I've done. I don't. Well, here's, I guess we'll close. We're about to be ready to close up. Um, maybe one or two more quick questions. The one I have to ask, I suppose, as a historian, is if a historian watches this later, writing about feminism or writing about women growing up in Chicago in the 60s, what would you tell them is um, one thing we can learn from what women activists were doing? 
Well, I think if you're a historian, you need to vet what we say against certain things that were going on in society. I mean, this is all before Title IX was passed. This is all before women were allowed to have credit in their own name. This is all before, I mean, there's a certain set of, um, on the superstructure level, rights that women gained that hadn't happened then. I mean, they weren't that important to me because I was young enough right. that it didn't really matter. You know, I had the right to work. I could work. You know, I had a Social Security account in my own name. But, and I think that that's something It's like really hard if you don't immerse yourself and what was going on in that historical period. I don't mean in the activism. I mean in, like, what rights women had and didn't have. If you don't really think about that. Right. Abortion, yes, but, I mean, things like not being able to have a credit not being able to sign a lease on an apartment. Not being able to have a credit card. Not being able to have a credit card. You know, not being able to have a car loan. So you really were beholden on either having a father or a husband who bought you a car or who held title to the car, the way divorce... Not being able to play sports, did you have... Oh, no, that's Title IX. No, we didn't have any girl... No, no, no. You were a cheerleader or pom-pom girl. You didn't have, like, a soccer team or something. I mean, we didn't even think of that as... That was one of the things that the women's union largely threw a, a lot of the, I want to say older, but they were probably late 20s lesbians, were like, no. We want a softball team. We want to be on the list at Horner Park. We want our league to be on that list along with all the... That was unheard of. It is so easy to forget that. It has to... All of the things that people learn about the women's movement of that time has to be seen against that backdrop. That was a controversial thing to go and argue that at Horner Park there should be a girls' league. Really? Really? There's no... You know, it shouldn't be, um, it's like a no-brainer that it was the lesbian bars that sponsored those things. What other bar was going to do it? It didn't mean that everybody who was on the team was a lesbian, right. but who they else? Were the ones that, that wanted it bad enough. That were they were the to ones who were willing represent. to say, yes, there should be a women's team. That's not, con I mean, you look back in your lifetime, it's not a big deal. But I was in college when Title IX was passed. What do you think that the major? What's the? I think Title IX is actually more important. Ha, has is more of a pivotal place. If you were a historian and you want to look at how how the um, the the social dynamics changed, I think Title IX has to be given huge. It has I think it could really like if you were doing a dissertation, you could use before and after Title IX and what Title IX set into motion because it challenged some of the parts of society that were most male-dominated. And it didn't do that because they were most male-dominated. It did it for inclusion. Right. But in fact, it was challenging some things that were really sacred, sacred, sacred in the male world. So if you look today... This is always helpful, too, for today. What is the battle for Title IX today? What are the contemporary issues right now for women and for... Maybe not just for women, but this, this project is particularly interesting to women, but for people in general that... You know, that's a really good question. I mean, if you look at the, um, the setbacks in terms of, you know, self-determination for women, the setbacks in the last few years... You could say that is. I'm not sure. I mean, I would like that would be a fun thing to sit around and talk to people about yeah. what they would see as the equivalent of t Title IX for now. Right. I'm not sure what that would be. I mean, there's been a set, series of setbacks in recent you had years. Mentioned Hobby Lobby a minute ago. Mm -hmm. Yes. So well, that's part of what I mean set about he setbacks. Mm. But Title IX was a move forward. So if you say what's today's Title IX, and you you know, right. then you're you're asking me to look forward, well, I and see on the I see this all morning, of these. There was um, the question of whether should employers' health insurance coverage cover? Yes, I know. I don't know. Had that ever been on a ballot before? No, yeah, I didn't think so. No, but that's still trying to um, sort of staunch the wound. That isn't. I mean, Title IX was definitely completely looking forward.
And I'm not sure what that is today. So the last question here is, um, is there anything else you'd like to talk about that we haven't touched upon? No, I'm cool. You know, I mean... <laughs> I'm cool. You've we've we've been here for an hour and fifty three minutes, mm -hmm. so it's been a long time. Mm -hmm. It goes by so fast, and I mean you've been involved in so much here. I could talk to you all day, but yeah. So I just wanted to say thank you.